Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burrs. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Justin Amash. He's the Libertarian Congressman from Michigan's 3rd Congressional District. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Representative Amash. Hey guys, thanks for having me on. We walked into Congress in January of 2011. Um, what surprised you the most uh, in those first months after getting into Congress? What surprised me was how little people knew about uh, the functioning of Congress. <laughs> so I, I went to the House floor and asked about uh, procedures, and very few people knew the answers. They didn't even know uh, the, the types of procedures we were voting on, like when we'd vote on ordering the previous question or a motion to recommit or various other uh, procedural votes that we take. And I, for me, process has always been um, paramount to protecting liberty. The idea that you understand the process um, and you utilize the process in a way that protects people's rights. And the fact that they didn't know how the process was working out was really um, concerning. This is besides the fact that they didn't know what they were voting on substantively, the legislation they weren't very familiar with. But not knowing the process is really dangerous because if you don't know the process, people can slip all sorts of things past you. Is there like an orientation? Because I mean, a lot of people, you could get elected to Congress and not know much about actually how that body works. Do they bring you in and say, you know, welcome to Congress and take you on a tour and all this stuff? There's an orientation, but it's not um, the type of orientation that would be very useful for actually doing your job on the House floor. And that's on purpose. The leadership team likes to keep members in the dark. It works to their advantage. Obviously, if a few people at the top know all the information, know how the system works, and the people who are rank and file members don't know anything about it, that works to the advantage of leadership. Um, and then they can uh, rally support for whatever legislation they want to pass or rally opposition. And a lot of the members don't really know the ins and outs um, of the battle. And I, that works to their advantage. That sounds almost like dastardly, like that they're, <laughs> they're, you're, they're, they're colleagues, you're supposed to be, they might be in the same party or they were for, for some period of time and they're like actively working against you. Yeah. I mean, you could put it that way, that they're actively working against you. I mean, at the end of the day, what the leaders want on each side is power and the way they maintain power is by maintaining their numbers. So they look at it as more of a collective. Um, we're not individual representatives. We're there as part of a collective, as part of a particular team, team red or team blue. And, um, and now I'm on team gold, you know, I'm on my doing my own one man <laughs> team right now, but, um, but they look at it as just a collective and you are just pawns in their operation. And as long as they have a bigger team, they get to control the process and they get to control what comes to the floor and they get, they get to control the narrative. So each side, whether it's Nancy Pelosi or Kevin McCarthy, uh, each side is trying to get the upper hand in terms of numbers. And they don't really care about the individuals as individuals. It's just how can we get another number to keep ourselves in power? And, um, and that's why they're pretty much okay with... Um, you know, members of, of all stripes, as long as you fall in line when it counts. So as long as you don't cause problems for whatever operation they're running, they really don't care um, whether you're a nationalist or a libertarian or anything else. But when the big votes come up, you'd better vote with them. So you better put it, you better set aside your principles when the big vote comes up. How much of the willingness to, I guess, be part of that collective when it comes to voting is, is a selection bias of the kinds of people who typically end up in Congress? So if you run as a Republican and then you get elected by Republican voters, you are the kind of person who is already predisposed to go along with the sorts of things that Republican leadership wants versus you've got your own ideas, you've got your own principles, the things you want to do when you're running for Congress. But when you get in, you you kind of subsume those into the collective or at least more willingly overlook them when leadership wants you to do something else. So, I mean, people come in with principles. There's no doubt about it. A lot of people come in with pretty strong principles. 
but they uh, are willing to cast those principles aside. And I don't know if this was uh, the the question directly, but they're they're pretty willing to cast those principles aside to stay in the game. At the end of the day, they think to themselves, uh, well, if I'm voted out of office, then what use are my principles? So they are pretty willing to bend those principles. And it usually starts with something small. And as time goes on, um, it becomes something bigger and bigger until eventually you don't have any principles and you're just a different person. Like when I look at some of my colleagues who come into Congress, uh, over a period of five or six years, they're almost completely different people. They're <laughs> like, you could talk to someone on day one and they're one thing. And, you know, on day 1000 of being in Congress, it's a different human being altogether. And um, almost like a zombie. And there's no hope for them. You can't um, bring them back. They're just, you know, and they're going to try and zombify other people. So it, it's, it's scary. Um, it's scary what happens. And, and, and when I go to town halls, for example, in my district, I often hear from people, why are uh, these people in Congress doing X, Y, and Z and, you know, hurting us and violating our rights? And don't they have any principles? And everyone seems to think when they're on the outside, well, if only I were in there, I would have principles and I'd stand up for what's right. But actually what happens repeatedly is people come to Congress with those principles and then the system beats it out of them. And they don't have principles after sometimes only a few months, but usually after a few years, those principles are gone and they're, um, you know, they're things they might talk about, but not really follow through on. So this is sort of, Public choice 101 is true, I guess. That I mean, the, the the name of getting elected becomes getting reelected becomes the predominant concern, and then realizing that you have to work with the party leaders to help f- facilitate that means that you just sort of subsume yourself to that the general team, correct? Yeah, that's correct, and a lot of it has to do with uh, financing of elections. And I'm not one of these guys who's for the you know the government getting all involved in financing elections or anything like that, but. Um, There is a problem. I don't know how to resolve it because I'm a big believer in free speech. I believe that people should be able to raise money and spend money on these campaigns. Um, That's that's freedom. That's part of our system uh, in order to protect our rights. But it, it does cause problems when Nancy Pelosi or Paul Ryan or John Boehner or Kevin McCarthy right now on the Republican side, when they can amass so much in terms of resources, and they have so much um, political power to control donors, so they can direct donors, donate to this person, don't donate to that person. There's a few people at the top who control so much of the power structure that um, people are left helpless. I mean, if you really had, for example, a uh, libertarian uh, financing structure that was competing with Republicans and Democrats, you'd have a lot of people who become libertarians because they'd be less worried about getting voted out of office. Or if you had people who are protecting the principled members of each party, you know, the principled progressives or whatever, you'd have more principled progressives. But the fact is the people at the top control so much of it and the other people just have to fall in line or they're out and they know it. They know they're out. They're not going to survive that election if they don't fall in line. Um, it's a rare thing to develop the kind of rapport like I have in my district where I was able to be an independent. It's it's pretty rare. It doesn't um, come often. For, for most members of Congress, you defy your leadership and you're out pretty soon. The way you've just described most many members of Congress is is quite negative. And I'm curious if you know the the giving up of the principles the they become zombies they subsume themselves to the the needs and desires of leadership and so on is that a characterization that they would i guess admit to behind closed doors or do they still think they have principles i think uh, yeah <laughs> i think some of them would admit it others think they have principles but they're being practical for, for them, it's just a matter of being practical about their principles. Yeah, I'm, I'm still principled, they think to themselves, but, but I'm being practical about it. I'm trying to 
um, stay in the game so I can fight, uh, an, you know, live to fight another day or, or something like that. But they never get to that other day. You know, they always say, well, I'll just sell out a little bit on this one and then I'm still in the game and I can fight on the next one. But you're never rewarded for having sold out on the previous one. It's not like the next time leadership comes to you, you're like, hey, I, I did what you wanted last time. Now you've got to give me a pass on this one. No, no, no. Leadership says, no, you're going to sell it on this one too, or else you're toast. And it, it, it repeats itself and they never break out of it. There's no way to break out of it. And you can tell um, who's going to be a good rep and who's going to be a bad rep based on their character, based on um, their strength of personality pretty quickly. I mean, it doesn't take long to see who's going to break and who's going to stick with it. You can tell by their personality. And even if they're principled for a little while, you can see certain characteristics where this guy has a pretty weak personality or he, he's, he wants to be loved by people too much, the people around him. And if you want to be loved by the leadership team and loved by the lobbyists and loved by the others who are surrounding you on Capitol Hill, you'll break pretty quickly and, and you're not coming back. Yeah. You can't, you, I mean, it's interesting because it seems like if you, it, some of the collective action problem with leadership has the money, as you said, which is important. They also can, I guess, dangle committee committees is a big part yep. of their power. Correct. Which That's affects, correct. Yeah. yeah. Which affects your fundraising abilities. Um, but yeah. And, you, you and, know. and people should know the committees are basically just fundraising projects for the most part. I mean, the committees don't even have the power they used to. If you went back, you know, generations, you would find that the committees were actually uh, quite powerful and able to move their own legislation. But now they're really just uh, reflective of the leadership team. So the speaker controls the committees right now on the Democratic side and McCarthy controls it on the Republican side. And they don't have the same leeway to do what they want. Um, so really what the committee has come down to is fundraising. You know, it's a it's a fundraising outlet. If you put on if you get put on financial services, well, you're going to get some money from banks and financial institutions. Um, so it's it's that kind of thing. So you, um, I, I'm sure you probably had an interesting conversation. I think Representative Lewis had been the longest serving member until he until he passed. But with the people who had who went back, like older members of Congress, or maybe people who are no longer members of Congress, who like talked about how things used to be. Did you, did you ever have those conversations about how things used to be? Well, there are people, you know, I'm, I'm not one of these uh, guys who thinks that the past was perfect and things were great. Um, there were some things that were better about the past and some things that were worse um, in terms of legislative process. But um, yeah, I've talked to members who think that it was more bipartisan in the past, past um, that you could uh, break from your party more often. In the past, the parties were more flexible in that sense. The uh, committees had more influence and more um, independent power separate from the uh, party apparatus. So, yeah, there were some some good things about the past in that respect, um, that there was more independence. Uh, there was more of a willingness to break for your team and, and money didn't dominate it as much as today. On the other hand, there was certainly less transparency. 30 or 40 years ago, you didn't know what was going on. So um, we don't know what kind of deals were cut. We don't know what kind of corruption happened. We, we don't know all of that stuff the same way we know now. Um, it's possible that a lot of the hostility that people feel toward Congress today has to do with the fact that we can see a lot more of it, that we can see what's going on. If something bad happens, we see it up front. If someone was doing something, um, you know, terrible in the past, we might not even see it. And, and so that probably helps their image. I think a lot of our listeners probably still have the, the schoolhouse rock view of the way a bill became, becomes a law. And so it might be interesting if you could give us maybe a revised version of that based on how you see things <laughs> actually working from the inside. Well, there are a lot, there's a lot to this, but in the simplest sense, the leadership team is really in charge of the legislation. 
there is not a process where a member comes up with a great idea and then it's run through a committee and it's uh, it's amended in an open process and then it comes to the floor and you get an, a nice, beautiful open process where members offer their amendments and suggestions and we have votes. It, it doesn't really work like that, except in very, very unusual circumstances. You might have some rare circumstances where that still happens, but it's, it's highly unlikely in most instances. Um, things come to the floor pretty directly now. You know, the leadership comes up with an idea. You can see even, I mean, it's it's gotten more pronounced during this COVID-19 situation, but the legislators aren't even doing any of the legislative work. We're told to come back to D.C. when the bill is done. And then it's take it or leave it. And in fact, um, I have brought this up before, and a lot of people at home might not know this, but, you know, when I'm talking about how in the past, you might have brought bills to the floor and been able to offer amendments. Paul Ryan, when he became speaker, became the first speaker in history, in the history of our country, to not allow any amendments on the floor that were not pre-approved by the leadership team. So he had to approve of the amendment before it could come to the floor. We had uh, we have what's called um, and so he changed the rules? Yeah. Did he, he change the actual rules? Well, no, rules? It, it's just that we have bills come to the floor under um, th three different systems. There's an open, what's called an open rule. There's a structured rule. And then there's a closed rule. And in the past, you, you more often had, in the distant past, you more often had open rules where a bill comes to the floor and anyone can offer an amendment. And as long as it's germane to the bill, you can um, vote on that amendment and it either passes or it doesn't. And the leadership team doesn't really have anything to do with it. They can't stop it as long as it's germane to the bill. Over time, there was more of a move to structured rules, which means you have to offer your amendment to the rules committee and the rules committee will decide whether you can have a vote on that amendment. And then there's something called a closed rule where the process is completely closed. A bill just comes to the floor and it's take it or leave it. Now, what's happened increasingly over the years is we've gone from having more open rules to no open rules. So currently, since Paul Ryan became speaker, there was a, a period in Paul Ryan's speakership where we stopped having open rules and we still haven't had any through Speaker Pelosi's speakership. We just stopped. Congress just stopped. There, there was, they decided there will be no more votes on the House floor that are open to amendment, where you can just bring your, off, your idea to the floor, and if it's germane, you can offer it. Increasingly, we have what's called structured rules, but especially increasingly, closed rules, where you just take it or leave it. Now, we still have had structured rules under Ryan and Pelosi. But what that means in practice is that you have to get your amendment approved by the speaker. And if your amendment isn't approved by the speaker, you can't vote on it. And you can imagine what kind of amendments they approve. They're only going to approve your amendment if it doesn't do anything. So it's totally uh, like useless. It's maybe some kind of messaging amendment or something that doesn't really do anything in practice. Or if they're very confident and has no chance of passing. It's a, it's a wild idea, but they want to give you something and, and you'll have a vote on it, but they know it's not going to pass. So if you offer an amendment that has a good chance of passing and is a good idea, they're not going to let you have it on the floor. And, and what it, this changes the way the legislative process works, because what happens now with members of Congress, if they know that the amendment won't get approved for a vote on the floor, what happens? They stop offering amendments. Why are you going to waste your time drafting a really good amendment and getting all sorts of support from your colleagues, bipartisan support, when you take the rules committee and you know they're going to reject it because it's popular? They will reject it because it's popular. So people just stop amending things. And now we're left more and more with uh, structured rules where you know the amendments are kind of puff amendments that don't do much 
and closed rules where it's completely take it or leave it. And that's increasingly been the case where we're told, come back to Washington, D.C. We're going to have a vote on a bill. Take it or leave it. My head is spinning. That would be that would end up being a very long schoolhouse rock episode that would <laughs> that would have a lot of ins and outs to it. Um, but is there? I mean, we have so caucuses. You used to be a member of the House Freedom Caucus, um, and uh, is it feasible to work behind the scenes to the point that you could get enough people supporting you that you can flip the leadership? Or they, do do they not even listen to? It? I mean, it seems it's like it's something so popular. Look, I have three hundred and thirty you know, support like mem- members of Congress supporting this amendment and like they would still stop something like this. Yeah. Um, it's basically impossible because you won't get now, if you really had 330 and it was bipartisan, you might be able to get some movement on it because, um, you can always, uh, threaten to, um, have it brought to the floor directly. If, if you collect enough signatures, you can ha- you can bypass the normal process and bring something to the floor, um, but that is very rare because it requires some cooperation between Republicans and Democrats. Um, it requires Republican and Democratic leadership to sort of accept that this is going to happen. What what the leadership teams will do if they start to see something like this moving that's popular, and if they want to shut it down, they will start to threaten the people who have influence. So they'll start to threaten the committee chairs. They will um, threaten some of the people who are close to leadership. No, don't do this. Don't sign on to that. Don't be a part of this. And if you get enough of those people, it starts to trickle down. So if you can convince, for example, um, 40 of your members um, not to sign on or not to participate, and these are 40 prominent members, and for example, they're um, chairman or chairman of committee or or of subcommittees or or something like that. Then other people uh, will also follow their lead because they don't want to get on the bad side of of the people. They need to get ahead. That, that reminds me of um, uh, well, the, actually, have you seen the show Veep? Any of the show Veep? Uh, yeah, can- yeah. Because that is, I've always said, it seems like it's a documentary, but I've, I've been at Cato my whole time in Washington. So I actually haven't been, been around working in, in Congress, but there's a line in Veep where, where she says that about a senator said, he's like, he's like a rushing nesting doll. He comes with multiple senators stuffed inside of him. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> like That's this right. Is what you, when you're going for the leadership in, in that regard. Uh, now you mentioned the partis parties element, and I said the Freedom Caucus seemed like it was going to be a good thing, and maybe that's a way of getting some people together on some issues and forming thing, and maybe crossing party lines on some issues such as national security. But it doesn't happen as much as you hope. How how much is the animosity level, the partisan animosity level? How high is it? Just like interpersonally, even. Well, I I think. In terms of our relationships, in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm not a very partisan person at all. So um, that's why I'm not one of the two, not in one of the two yeah, parties. Yeah, you're right not now, representative. But, yes, I agree. But, but I would say as a general matter, people have good personal relationships. I think that's where people at home are, um, are misled uh, quite a bit. I mean, there's other ways in which they're misled, but they're definitely misled about this one. A lot of what you see on TV is theater. In other words, you could see two people who are so hostile to each other, two representatives, two senators, but actually they're friends. But on TV, they're, they're enemies. On Twitter, they're enemies. And you don't even know it. You wouldn't know it based on what they're saying to each other. They might call each other names. They might do all sorts of things to insult each other. But then behind the scenes, they're actually friends. This reminds they me might of pro, good. pro wrestling. It reminds you of pro wrestling. It's, it's, it is a little bit like that. Yeah, absolutely. Because the, the goal for so many of them is just to stay in power. And the way they stay in power is by catering to their base. So they're willing to, uh, I guess, fake it to make it. You know, They will fake the animosity in order to survive. They have to pretend they, they hate someone. Um, you know, there are people I'll see, uh, just AOC is a good example, right? Um, she has a good relationship with many, many members of Congress and many Republicans, but you'd never know it. 
you never know it. She's, you know, in, in person, she's actually uh, a person that gets along with people. But you wouldn't know it based on the way people react to her on Twitter or on TV. These same people who behind the scenes might be friends with her uh, will say vicious things. And, um, you know, and I mean, personal things. It's fine to disagree on policy. I disagree with her on many, many policies. But it's so uh, strange to me for someone to be that two-faced where they will be kind to someone in person. They'll be kind to her in person, but then go on TV and say horrible things. Just, you know, be nice to people or don't be nice to them. But but choose. Which one are you? Are, are you friends with someone or are you enemies? Make your choice. Just because you're friends with someone doesn't mean you have to agree with them on the policies. You know, I have lots of friends on both sides of the aisle who I don't agree with on policies, but, you know, we're, we're good friends. But I don't try to pretend then on social media or on TV that I hate the person. I'll just say I disagree with them on the policy. And, um, and so I think people at home are, are misled. They'll watch these committee hearings and they'll see the Republicans and Democrats saying really vicious things about each other. Uh, the, is the gentleman saying blah, blah, blah? Well, I think that's racist or whatever. They'll say all sorts of things. They'll accuse each other of all sorts of things. Then they'll go and have uh, lunch together or they'll have a good laugh when the cameras are off. And I don't know. I don't understand it. I don't understand that kind of stuff. Disagree on the policy, but don't pretend you're something you're not. If you're friends with someone, don't pretend you're enemies. Shifting gears just a little bit, um, the Constitution grants a certain set of powers to the executive and a certain set of powers to Congress. But one of the things that we have increasingly seen is Congress abdicating its powers to the executive or letting itself be guided by the executive more than a lot of us would like. And while it seems to be the case, as you describe it, that that members may do what House or Senate leadership wants them to do, why would House and Senate leadership and representatives in general be so willing to abdicate power to the executive? That's a, that's a great question. It, it's the same reason that the members are willing to abdicate power to the leadership, right? You, you think the members might rise up and say, we don't like this system. Um, we want a system where we have more openness and we can participate. But actually, the members like the system. They like the idea that the leaders decide things for them. They don't have to really think. And then they get money from the leadership team to stay in office. And they also get bills handed to them. So you might see a member of Congress who, who passes quite a few bills. You'll notice that there's a very high correlation between members of Congress who are, who are in tough districts and members of Congress who pass a lot of bills. Because those bills don't really do anything, but they're handed those bills so they can say they help veterans or seniors, whoever it is, with some, some kind of ticky-tack bill that doesn't really do much, but then they can run a campaign ad. So the members of Congress love this kind of stuff. They don't have to think. They don't have to do much of anything. They don't have to really be legislators. Um, and they get reelected to Congress because the leadership team basically takes care of them. Fall in line and you're taken care of. Well, a similar dynamic plays out with, uh, with the White House, where if you can leave things to the White House to make uh, you know, critical decisions, like about war, for example, well, then you don't have to take the blame. So they can say, well, the president decided to do that. And if they, if they like what the president ultimately did, if it turns out well, they'll say, yeah, I was with him all along. And if they don't like it, they say, oh, I can't believe he did that. I can't believe he took us to war. And I can't believe he used his powers in this way. Um, or, or, he, or he misused powers. He used powers he doesn't have. They can't believe it. But, um, you know, it's, a, it's another way of, uh, of passing the buck and not having to face the pressure. They would rather someone else take the heat. And, and so over time, you've had that kind of transfer of power. But I, I want to mention very quickly one more way in which the power is transferred. I, I talked about how the leadership teams 
have power concentrated um, within those teams. In other words, the rank and file members don't have much power or influence. Well, this is another way in which the executive branch gains power because the president knows when he is dealing with any piece of legislation that he only has to negotiate with a few people, primarily the Speaker of the House and the Senate Majority Leader. So really, the president is working in a three-person negotiation, and often one of those persons will be someone from his own party. So there's a three-person negotiation. It's pretty easy. The president gets a lot of leverage in that situation. Imagine a different system, this, the way it's intended to work, where the rank and file members have a lot of power. You have an open process. Things are very amendable. The leadership team is not dictating outcomes, but the process leads to a discovery of outcomes. Imagine a system like that. Now, when a bill comes to the president's desk, he has very little ability to negotiate something that he wants. He's basically left with what Congress wants. Because if he wants to make a change, he knows that the speaker is going to bring it back to the full house and there's going to be an open process and it's quite possible he doesn't get that change that he wants. So this concentration of power at the top has really empowered the executive branch and it's probably the most significant way in which the executive branch has been empowered and yet it is never talked about. I don't think there are many people talking about it other than me. I, I, I just don't hear it very often that the concentration of power at the top of Congress leads to a, a more powerful executive branch. But that is a critical aspect um, of, of why power has shifted toward the executive branch. Yeah, I've, I've written, contributed or written hundreds of, of briefs, amicus briefs in the Supreme Court on why the executive is too powerful and studied extensively, but I've, I've never heard this, uh, what you just said. It's, it's a fascinating dynamic. I think one of the things that, as, as a constitutional scholar, one of the things that the framers probably would have been most surprised at, just it would not predict, is they, that Congress would not jealously guard its power. That it would that it would not resist encroachment by the executive, but instead uh, would would willingly give it away, uh, which is interesting. Because of course, that process, and you know, you went to law school, has been you know for a very long time since say the New Deal. But you came up uh, at a time when you in a the Tea Party wave, when you created the opposition Congress uh, and all the animosity toward President Obama, and now and now you've seen what's happened in Trump. Um, how has that changed? You know, when you're an opposition party, and then you be, you kind of go back and forth. How how has that changed in terms of the relationship with the executive? And then I guess later we can just talk about Trump himself, but more about the the shifting too. Well, I think I mean, he, everyone knows there's bias out there. Um, there is a belief that your party is good and the other party is bad. Um, that's pretty widespread uh, among people who are politically active. Most Americans are not very politically active, and I don't think they think this way. But among those who are politically active on Twitter, um, political pundits and, and those types of people, um, there's a sense that, yeah, your, your president is a good president and the other president is a bad president, the one who's from a different party. And they're held to different standards. So... Uh, when I came in in 2011, uh, I was under the impression that Republicans wanted to limit government and um, cut spending and hold the executive branch accountable and uh, make Congress more open and accountable to the people. I thought that that's what Republicans wanted. But we've seen over the past several years that that's not really what they want. They wanted to stick it to President Obama. So, you know, I've been consistent in this in, a, in opposing um, excessive executive power and in wanting to uh, restore our constitutional system. But a lot of my colleagues, the vast majority of them have not been that way. And when President Trump comes in and says he wants to use emergency powers or he wants to use the military on American soil, imagine if, if Obama had said that there would be such an outrage. They would have impeached him, you know, within a day if he had said something like that. Um, There's about and, 3 million and, things that if Obama would have said <laughs> and that Trump said that they would have impeached him on. Yes. That's, that's absolutely right. So, you know, there's just a, um, there's an inconsistency. There's a bias 
And it's part of life um, that there are biases and inconsistencies, but really our, our system where um, power has gotten so concentrated at the top has really uh, magnified this problem and made it much larger than it otherwise would be. Uh, when only a few people control all of Congress, you stop thinking about policies, you th stop thinking about, um, you know, what's right and what's good and, and what your principles are, and you, you start thinking more about teams. Um, and that's the focus, really, in, in Congress now. It's very much along those lines. And then because Congress is so focused on this team mentality, team red versus team blue, well, that trickles back down to society. And you see the same thing back home. And then they see people back home thinking team red versus team blue. And then that, uh, you know, trickles back up. It's like a, it's a, you know, a, a feedback loop. And they, nobody is able to break out of it. All of this seems particularly egregious under Trump. It, it almost feels like the Republican Party has turned into a personality cult. Is that, is that true? Is that fair? Um, has it gotten better? And I guess related to that, like, what do you see as the future of the Republican Party post-Trump? Like, can they, can we dig out of, can the Republicans dig out of this? Or, or is this personality cult nature going to permanently harm the party? Well, I would say um, when we talk about personality cult, it, it is a uh, significant segment of the party now, but not the entire party. I think that there are a lot of um, Republicans out there who don't particularly like Donald Trump. To this day, they don't like him, but they put up with him because they view um, him as, as sort of their man fighting the fight against the left. And if he's the best we can do right now, he's the best we can, we can do. So, you know, I think that a lot of those people would be thrilled to have a, a different Republican um, as president or, or someone else who's, you know, uh, more respectful and um, has, has a very different approach. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. I think Donald Trump is a reflection of a shift that's been happening within the Republican Party toward nationalism and populism. And, um, and he is not the cause of it. He's more of a symptom. And while it's not the majority of the party, it's a substantial portion to the point where it's very difficult to reel it in because... Uh, a lot of these individuals are the most politically active, the most aggressive, and the most willing to to fight for what they want. And um, and so I don't think that that's going to go away anytime soon. I I think that there's this myth that developed that Republicans, for example, who don't like Trump, are just so easily going to be swayed to vote for Joe Biden or to go with the Democrats. And while there are Republicans who will do that. I think they tend to be uh, Republicans who are um, like more uh, in in the coasts, in professional power centers. Um, you'll see these people on Twitter with blue check marks. But if you talk to Republicans throughout the country, I don't think you see that very often. I, I think these um, individuals who don't like Donald Trump will still vote for him. And when um, this election happens, whatever happens, if Donald Trump wins or loses, I think Trumpism is here to stay for a while. Donald Trump is not going to go away if he loses. He's going to keep tweeting. He's going to remain very influential within the Republican Party. Um, and it's possible he'd run again. You couldn't rule that out, that he wouldn't run again. Um, Four years later, you certainly can't rule out that his son wouldn't run or um, or someone else within this, you know, Trump world isn't going to run for president. And if he wins uh, this election, then Republicans are going to have to 
deal with the fact that this is here to stay for a while. This isn't some temporary thing. I think a lot of Republicans have put up with him uh, uh, with the idea that it's a temporary thing. But if he wins again, I think they'll they'll see, they'll start to see this is not a temporary thing. And, um, and this is where, as a libertarian and someone who's a member of the Libertarian Party, I think that there is an opening for classical liberals to leave the Republican Party and join the Libertarian Party. I think that is possible, regardless of whether Trump wins or loses. I think when people start to see that Trumpism is here to stay, there will start to be a shift. That would be great because you, you got made me a little bit ter- terrified when you mentioned his son running. <laughs> I, like, I hadn't <laughs> considered that. Um, oh, yeah. I don't think I don't think they're going away anytime no, I soon. I agree with you. And then you have people like Josh Hawley. And yes, um, in the 2016 election, we saw we saw I mean, I think I have to believe I mean, you've had private conversations and you don't have to, of course, you know, to give give anyone up. But like so many of your colleagues on in both houses had to have been astonished and not like Trump, but then what they said, you know, in public was different. And, and now, and now did you think there would be more holding him to account or did you kind of expect these, these forces that, that you just discussed to kind of, you know, fall into line. And then once again, the executive has too much power and kind of holds the the Senate and the house uh, in his clutches. So they did, hold the line for a while. I I believe that for a while, the Freedom Caucus and conservatives and others who care about principles or cared about principles at the time were going to hold the line and hold Trump accountable. And if you look back at the um, first year uh, in which Trump was in office, the Freedom Caucus pushed back against him a lot. I mean, he called for the Freedom Caucus to be defeated in elections. He literally tweeted about defeating the Freedom Caucus, that they had to be defeated. So there was um, not perfect pushback, not the kind of pushback I would like to see, but there was pushback at first. And then what happened was the 2018 election. And what Republicans saw in the 2018 election was that by not sticking with Trump as much as they maybe um, were being pressed to do by the president, they lost. They lost. They, Trump was able to say after 2018, look, in 2016, we ran a very Trumpy campaign and we won. In 2018, you guys uh, tried to walk away from me and you focused on the issues rather than um, sort of the you know cultural divide or the personality politics, and you lost. You lost seats in the House big time. So what happened after 2018 was Republican leaders, both um, for the party itself, like Kevin McCarthy, and in the Freedom Caucus, start to shift. They said, hey, we have to take a different approach. We've got to stick with this guy. And you could see the shift very clearly. They they established a, a much closer relationship with the president. They basically start to adopt his talking points and, his, and they embraced him. McCarthy, instead of trying to shy away the way that Paul Ryan did, you know, Paul Ryan was always hesitant. McCarthy just embraced Trump and said, yes, we're fully with Trump. And um, and that's where I think it uh, went past the point of no return. I think there's no going back from that in the near future. The, the party fully embraced it. Party leaders embraced it. The House Freedom Caucus embraced it. And there was no going back at that point. And Trump, smartly, and I, I do think Trump is a um, strong campaigner, even if I totally repudiate and disagree with his approach. Trump smartly embraced these people who he was fighting with before. He, he embraced establishment leaders. He embraced the Freedom Caucus. He brought them into his administration. And by doing so, he basically took over the entire party. And I don't think that there's any going back from that in the near future. So can we do anything to fix it? 
in a, in a both immediate I, and long term? I, I think there's no way to fix it in the short term in, in terms of changing the party. The party is what it is. Now, what about Congress? I, I join. That's that's an even that's a big, bigger uh, big, question. Yeah. That's a bigger issue, and um, and that's a matter of uh, moving power away from leadership. But the only way that's going to happen is through grassroots efforts. It's not going to happen from the inside. If if I ran for speaker, on the notion that I'm going to um, force everyone to vote on all sorts of things. They're going to take all sorts of tough votes. And by the way, I'm also not going to um, go around the country raising money for you. You're going to have to do that yourselves. I'm not just going to start handing out cash if you, you know, vote with me as speaker. You'd be laughed off the, uh, out, out of the race. They'd say, why would we want you as speaker? You're going to make us take tough votes and you're not going to give us money? So there's no way to change it internally. You have to change it from the outside. It's only through awareness, but the media won't cover this. I, I've gone on TV and I've, I've, I've written op-eds and done other things. The media ignore this. It's, it's the biggest problem we face right now in terms of our um, legislative system, and it's totally ignored. So uh, um, I don't think you're going to change that anytime soon. I don't think you're going to get rid of uh, Trumpism anytime soon. Oh, I joined the Libertarian Party because I think that in the next decade or so, there needs to be a strong opposition through a political party. I, I want a future where everyone is an independent, where you don't have to have party labels. But I think that is more of a long-term thing. People want to feel like they're a part of something. And right now, if... Um, you're going to defeat Trumpism, which I think is a, is a threat to our country, just the same as I think socialism is a threat to our country. If you're going to defeat Trumpism, you have to have a strong alternative. And I believe the Libertarian Party can be a strong classical liberal party that will bring people in from the Republican Party and from the Democratic Party, that you can form a strong coalition of people who are not represented by the two parties right now and um, and that it can compete. And maybe by 2022 or 2024, the Libertarian Party can pull enough people away from the Republican Party, can pull enough Democrats who are uh, disenchanted with the Democratic Party and have a strong coalition going forward um, and be a strong competitor and and maybe displace the old parties. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us in Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.